Hello, my name is Melissa. I'm a nurse with the Villages Health as well as a population health specialist. Today we're going to talk about stroke and heart attack prevention. The objectives for this class are to review the core components of stroke and heart attack uh, prevention. We'll discuss cholesterol, hypertension, a heart healthy diet, as well as stress. We'll also discuss tips, strategies, and awareness that increase prevention in the real world. Lastly, we'll make some lifestyle changes to decrease the risk. First, we're gonna discuss stroke. Many people either have had or know someone that has experienced a stroke and know that this is a scary thing. A stroke is actually the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. It's also the leading cause of adult disability. Around 800,000 Americans have a stroke each year. An American dies of a stroke every four minutes. These are the statistics from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and these numbers are steadily increasing. A stroke is when the blood supply to part of the brain is suddenly interrupted. Um, this is called an ischemic stroke. A stroke can also be when a blood vessel in the brain bursts, spilling blood into the spaces surrounding the brain cells. This is what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. We'll dive a little deeper into the two of these in just a moment. The two different types of stroke, as you can see in the pictures, a hemorrhagic stroke, the picture on the left, is when a blood vessel bursts within the brain. On the right, an ischemic stroke occurs when a blood clot blocks the blood flow in an artery within the brain. Now, this is the most common type of stroke that we see. Uh, in the picture on the right, you can see there's something obstructing. Um, so cutting off that blood flow where it's not able to get to the different areas of your brain. Anytime there is a possibility for a stroke, it is an emergency. Brain cells die when they no longer receive oxygen and nutrients from the blood or when they're damaged by sudden bleeding in or around the brain. When the blood flow to the brain is interrupted, some brain cells die immediately while others remain at risk for death. With timely treatment, some of these brain cells can be saved. So if a stroke is a possibility, it's very important to call and get help immediately. The common signs of stroke are listed here. And you'll notice the first underlined word for each bullet point is sudden. So you have sudden numbness or weakness, especially on one side of the body, sudden confusion or trouble speaking or understanding speech, sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes. It might be doubled vision, it might be blurred vision, uh, just trouble seeing in one or both of the eyes. Uh, could also have sudden trouble walking, some dizziness or loss of balance or coordination, this would be something that has changed from what their norm is. Um, so that sudden change or balance issue. Um, lastly here you see sudden severe headache with no known cause. So some people do experience headaches and they usually know what triggers it. Say if you, if you don't have your morning coffee or your caffeine, you know that you will develop a headache. So we have a cause for that headache. The signs of a stroke, we have sudden severe headache with no known cause. That's what you want to look for. Some people can experience uh, one of these symptoms. Some people can experience multiple. So again, if there's ever a possibility, um, it is an emergency. You want to definitely call 911 and get medical help. The FAST, F-A-S-T, test is something that uh, may help you to spot symptoms. So FAST, F stands for face. Ask the person to smile. 
do both sides of the mouth go up or does one side droop? Look at their arms. So A stands for arms. Have them lift their arms. Do both arms stay up or does one slowly drift down? S is for speech. Can the person repeat a simple sentence? Do you notice that they're having trouble with that sentence, repeating some of the words, or are they slurring some of the words? And T stands for time. Time is critical. If any of these are a possibility, call 911. Um, if any of these symptoms are present, so they can do their evaluation um, and, and take over care if needed. Now, some of the possible treatments for an ischemic stroke, uh, the treatment goal is to bust or remove the clot. So considered the gold treatment, um, it's, it's called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. Um, this is what's actually been approved by the FDA to help treat ischemic strokes. Uh, the doctor would administer the TPA through an IV in the arm, which would then dissolve the clot and help improve the blood flow to that part of the brain that's been cut off from the clot. Uh, this is a question that we, we hear a lot. So if it's administered within three hours, sometimes up to four and a half hours, considering the person, uh, the TPA may improve the chances of recovering from that stroke. So again, if someone is having a stroke, if you think some of these symptoms do apply, call 911 immediately. Tell the operator the symptoms and that you think that either you or the person that you're with may be having a stroke. And the last bullet point here, it's very important to note what time the symptom started. Because remember, we have that three hour time frame we're trying to stay in. So if you tell the operator, what time you first noted the symptoms, that, that lets them know a better idea of the next time uh, for all of the events that need to happen. So there are some modifiable risk factors that do come into play uh, to put you at a higher risk for uh, having a stroke. So you can see here there's high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, alcohol, and illegal drug use, being overweight, being physically inactive, uh, being on an unhealthy diet, as well as sleep and depression. So all of these things can put you at a higher risk for developing a stroke, but all of these are also modifiable. You can, you can possibly change your risk factor. Um, if you have high blood pressure, that's something that you should be working with your doctor. Uh, let them know that your blood pressure has been a little bit on the higher side so they can see if any uh, lifestyle changes need to be, be made to hopefully get your blood pressure within the recommended goal. Sometimes that is not able to be done with lifestyle changes. And then at that point, the doctor may suggest a prescription medication to help with your blood pressure readings as well. Now, heart disease um, is another one of their modifiable risk factors. So with any type of heart disease, you could have some of that plaque buildup um, within your arteries, not just in the heart, but also the vessels throughout the rest of your body. And uh, we discussed if there's a blockage that could prevent the blood flow getting to certain areas of your brain. Uh, being overweight and being physically inactive, as well as an unhealthy diet, these all do put you at a higher risk for having a stroke. So changing those lifestyle um, factors that you have, get on a good physical activity regimen, start some type of exercise program, um, as well as your diet. So we know lots of fruits, veggies, and whole grains are very important, um, not just for our uh, risk for developing a heart attack or stroke, but it's also beneficial for every part of our body. Uh, and then stress and depression, if you do have excessive amounts of these, it puts you at a higher risk. But all of the things on this slide here are modifiable, whether it be with lifestyle changes or working with your doctor, um, these all can be adjusted and hopefully get you out of that higher risk for having a stroke. Now we're gonna move into heart attack. Now, this is something that we hear a lot of. We, we see a lot of commercials, a lot of media about it, but do we really know what this is? So that's what we're gonna talk about. 
There are different types of heart attacks. So a heart attack is also called a myocardial infarction. It's also sometimes referred to as an MI. Our heart attack is when a blockage is in one or more of the coronary arteries there in the heart, which reduces or stops blood flow to that area. Um, then in turn, part of the heart muscle um, is not getting the proper amount of oxygen. So the blockage could be a complete blockage or it could be a partial. Um, either way, it's a heart attack. Now the other type is called a complete blockage of a coronary artery. That's called a STEMI, S-T-E-M-I. That stands for a ST elevation myocardial infarction. This is something that uh, if you're having symptoms and you go into the doctor or the hospital, they would be doing an EKG. And this would show up on the EKG. It would show an abnormality. This is a partial blockage. Uh, a complete blockage is a STEMI. A partial blockage would be an end STEMI heart attack, which is a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So a lot of big medical terms here, but either way, um, any way you look at it, it's still a heart attack, and this is also still an emergency. So we'll talk about some of the symptoms and some of the treatments for that as we go through the slides. So first we'll go over the signs and symptoms. So chest discomfort we'll see here is at the very top. Most heart attacks involve discomfort in the center of the chest that can last for a few minutes, um, and it may come and go. So it may not be constant. You might experience the symptoms for a few minutes, um, may go away for a few minutes, and then it might come back. It can feel like an uncomfortable pressure, squeezing, fullness, or pain. Um, some people describe it as if there is a cord wrapped around their chest or maybe an elephant sitting on their chest. There could also be some discomfort in other areas of the upper, bar upper body. Um, it could be in one or both of the arms, the back, neck, jaw, or stomach. Uh, the third possible symptom would be shortness of breath with or without chest discomfort. So you may just have shortness of breath. You may have shortness of breath with the chest discomfort. It doesn't have to be um, exactly what you see on the screen here. It could be a few or it could be only one. Um, one other, a uh, few other signs may include breaking out in a cold sweat, nausea, vomiting, or lightheadedness. Again, every person that has a heart attack doesn't necessarily experience all of these symptoms. Um, it could be a few of them, or it could just be one. But knowing what is a possibility is key. Now, heart attack signs in women um, are slightly different. So with women, an uncomfortable pressure, squeezing, fullness, or pain in the center of your chest, again, it can last for, um, a few minutes or more, and it can come and go. The pain can, can start, go away for a little bit, and then come back. Again, we'll see the pain or discomfort can be in one or both arms, the back, neck, jaw, or stomach. Um, shortness of breath. Sorry about that. Shortness of breath with or without chest discomfort. Um, and some of the other signs, which are similar to with men, uh, breaking out in a cold sweat, nausea or lightheadedness. Now, as with men, women's most common heart attack symptom is chest pain or discomfort. But women are somewhat more likely than men to experience some of the other common symptoms, specifically the shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, and back or jaw pain. So if you have noticed any of these symptoms, it's important to call 911 and get help on the way so they can get you to the hospital for the appropriate treatment. So with the signs and symptoms, you don't want to wait. You don't wanna say, well, I did have that large meal last night. Maybe it's just related to that. Okay, well, it could be, but what if it's not? Um, although some heart attacks, are, heart attacks are sudden and intense, most of them actually start out slowly with only mild pain. So it's important for you to listen to your body. Pay attention. Is it telling you something? You're your body's um, best advocate. So if you notice something is different, if something is off, 
we need to pay attention. And if it's something that we need to call for help, then do it. Call 911 if you experience or notice any of the signs or symptoms that we just discussed, because it's better safe than sorry. If it is a heart attack, let the doctors take over and let them do what's needed to get you um, well. So next we're gonna move to talking about cholesterol. So this is something that can be a little confusing, but hopefully this, this uh, seminar here will explain a little bit more and what you need to look at. So cholesterol is, by definition, a soft wax-like substance that your body uses for a few different things. It um, helps to protect nerves. It helps make cell tissues. Also produces certain hormones like estrogen, as well as it helps in digestion. Uh, your liver actually makes all the cholesterol that your body needs. So we have cholesterol, we need cholesterol, but we need it to a certain extent. Um, high levels can become dangerous. So that's what we'll go over. When you get your lab tests and your doctor's going over your cholesterol numbers, you're gonna see a few different things on there. Um, it could be called a cholesterol panel or it could be called a lipid, L-I-P-I-D, panel. Now this is what's going to hold all of your cholesterol numbers. Um, one of the ones that you'll see on there is called LDL. That stands for low density lipoprotein. Now this is what we call the bad cholesterol. So you'll see here the L for low. Just remember that that's the lousy one. This is the bad cholesterol. This makes up the majority of the body's cholesterol. It actually carries cholesterol to the cells of your body, including the arteries that supply the blood to your heart and brain. So if we have high levels of this bad cholesterol and it's going to our heart and brain, that would definitely put us at a higher risk for a possible heart attack or stroke. So having high levels of the LDL could then lead to the buildup in the arteries or plaque that we just discussed and puts you at a high risk for heart disease and or stroke. So this low density lipoprotein with your L, that's the lousy one, your bad cholesterol, we need to make sure we keep these numbers at a low, keep it, keep it below the range. Now, on the other hand, you're going to see one called HDL, or high-density lipoprotein. So the H, happy. We want these high. This is the good cholesterol. This helps carry cholesterol, triglycerides, and other fats away from the arteries and back to the liver, where it's then passed from the body. Our HDL makes up a quarter to a third of our blood cholesterol. And actually having high levels of the HDL help protect us um, from heart disease. So we want low LDL and high HDL. So remember the L and LDL, that's lousy. The H in your HDL, that's happy. We want those high. Now the other one that you'll see in your cholesterol or your lipid panel are your triglycerides. This might be noted as Trigs, T-R-I-G-S, might be abbreviated there, it's a long word. So this is a type of fat in the blood and fat tissue. The triglycerides actually contribute to the hardening and narrowing of your arteries. Having high levels of triglycerides puts you at a higher risk for heart disease and stroke. Um, whenever we take in excessive calories, they're converted into triglycerides. So say you're supposed to be having, um, you're on a 2,000 calorie diet and you go out on a Friday night and you have a total of 3,000 calories for the day, that extra 1,000 calories is going to be converted into the triglycerides in your body. So then in turn, that's going to back up to number two, contribute to the hardening and narrowing of your arteries. This is a type of fat. So having all of these excessive calories that are converted into triglycerides puts you at a higher risk for heart disease and stroke. Having diabetes, um, being obese, having kidney failure, or even alcoholism can also lead to high triglycerides. So making sure you're staying um, on top of your labs. If you have any of these other comorbidities, it's important to, to follow the schedule for your uh, lab test that your doctor recommends for you to make sure that your numbers aren't trending up, putting you at that higher risk for heart attack and stroke. 
So this is a uh, basic uh, panel here for your cholesterol numbers. Now you can see this comes from the National Institute of Health. This is a basic guideline that we go off of, but keep in mind your doctor may have a specific goal for you. Um, this is just the guideline that we go off of, but each person might have a different one. That would be a good question to talk to your doctor and see um, if they have a range that they want your cholesterol numbers to stay in. So this is the range for your total cholesterol. So you can see the top uh, to have it in the best range would have it lower than 200. Uh, borderline high, it's 200 to 239. And any, anything 240 and higher is considered high, then your cholesterol would be considered high. Now for our LDL, does anybody remember that L stands for lousy? That's the bad cholesterol. So best would be lower than 100. Now keep in mind here, if you have a history of heart disease, the goal would be less than 70. So there is a, a little bit of a difference there. If you do have a history of any heart disease, your ideal goal would be for your LDL to be below 70. If there is no history of heart disease, then less than 100 would be considered um, in the best range here. Uh, you can see further down near best is 100 to 129. Borderline high is 130 to 159. High 160 to 189. And then very high is 190 and up. So these numbers can actually get into the three and four hundreds. That's a little scary. So again, making sure you keep a close eye uh, when your doctor orders these lab tests, it's, it's for a reason. So we can make sure we keep track of what's going on inside of your body that we might not be able to see from the outside. So now we'll talk about the HDL. This is the happy, this is the good cholesterol. You can see there's a difference here at the top, um, the HDL level for women and then the HDL level for men. So the best range is 60 and higher. So we want this one high. The good range for women is 50 to 59. For men, it's 40 to 59. And then you would be considered at risk um, if it was less than 50 for a woman and less than 40 for a man. So again, this is just a basic guideline. So it's a good idea to talk to your doctor, see if they have a specific range for all of these different cholesterol levels for you specifically. Now we'll talk about the triglycerides. So you can see from the, the very first line there to the very bottom, so it's a good variation. So 150 and then at the bottom it's 500. So the desired range, the goal would be less than 150. Um, then we have borderline high, high, and very high. So very high is considered 500 and higher. Um, we've seen these even close to the thousands. So you can see that that's a big range. So your desired goal is less than 150. So that's something that if you've noticed your numbers are starting to trend up, talk to your doctor. Maybe you've made some of those lifestyle changes and your numbers are still climbing. Um, see if there's something else that they can suggest for you. Maybe if those lifestyle changes just aren't helping, maybe you have a family history of high cholesterol, let the doctor know that because it might be time to start on a medication that helps your lifestyle changes in combination to get your numbers back to where they need to be. High blood pressure. Again, something that we hear about, uh, everyone has a blood pressure. Some may be on the lower side, some may be on the higher side, but we'll get a little bit a better idea of where it should be and exactly what it is and what it does. So blood pressure, by definition, is the measurement of force applied to the artery walls. So in the picture there, you can see the white arrow um, pointing up and down. That's one artery, any artery in the body. So the pressure, um, the force that's being applied to the artery wall, that's what uh, creates your blood pressure numbers. Uh, over time, if the force of the blood flow is too high, the tissue that makes up the walls of the arteries can get stretched beyond the healthy limit, and that's when the damage can occur. So that's why it's important if your blood pressure is starting to trend up, 
Um, maybe not necessarily in the office because a lot of people, when they walk into their doctor's office, their blood pressure starts to go up immediately. Um, it's important to make sure you're monitoring your blood pressure at home as well. Keep a log of it and then bring it into your doctor so they can see what your blood pressure is running in your home, in your comfortable chair, in your comfortable space. And that'll help them determine if, if there is a change that needs to be made, maybe with medication to help get your numbers back to the, the healthy range. So again, this is just a basic guideline. Um, that that we go off of but you definitely should talk to your doctor and see what your recommended blood pressure range is so you can see in the green here it's considered normal so the first column here where it says systolic this is that top number when you check your blood pressure ideally it would be less than 120 and your bottom number which is the diastolic ideally less than 80. Now in the yellow range here where it's elevated, so 120 to 129 over something less than 80. Now as we get to the orange um, and darker reds here, you'll notice in this column here it says or instead of and like we did up at the top. So you can have um, 130 to 139 for your top number, but then your bottom number, that diastolic can be less than 80 you're still considered in that high blood pressure range. So if your blood pressure is 135 over 78, that's still considered in the orange range. Now moving down to the darker orange, uh, 140 or higher or 90 or higher. So say we have a 138 over 94. That still puts us in the stage two high blood pressure range. Now the very bottom one here in the dark red, this is a hypertensive crisis. This is a medical emergency. If your blood pressure is higher than 180 for your systolic, that top number, or if your bottom number, the diastolic, is higher than 120, either one or both, you should contact your doctor immediately um, for them to guide you as to what you should do from that point, because that's very dangerous having your blood pressure stay that high. Uh, we discussed some lifestyle changes that you can make uh, for stroke and heart attack prevention. So we'll go into that a little bit deeper now. So living a healthy lifestyle um, com is composed of a few different parts. So the first one is your weight. Maintain a healthy weight. Uh, most people have heard of a BMI, that's your body mass index, as well as body fat percentage. Um, there are lots of charts that you can go on. Um, you can go online and Google um, how to determine your BMI. Um, you can also come into our office. Um, we do a body composition analysis. That's a great place to get your BMI as well as your body fat percentage. Um, it's a free screening that we do. It takes about 10 seconds, um, and it will assess your weight, BMI, body fat percentage, basal metabolic rate, um, as well as your fat mass, fat-free mass, and even your hydration level. So it's going to print out a little receipt with all of that information, and you'll get to keep track of that. So if you're trying to lose weight, this would be a great start. Um, you can get your baseline and say you're on a new lifestyle change here. You've, you've changed your diet. You've started an exercise. You get on your scale at home and the numbers aren't changing, but your pants are a little looser. Well, that could be because you're losing that body fat percentage. That number is going um, changing, but your weight is staying the same because you're building muscle. So this is a good way to keep track of your successes if that's something that you're working on. Um, you can also start tracking your food and beverage intake on paper, or there's an online tool um, called the Super Tracker, and we have the website listed here. It's a hyperlink, choosemyplate.gov. It helps you keep track of what you're putting into your body, foods and drinks, so you can see if there's any trends. Um, maybe you notice in the evening you're having a little bit more sugar than you are any other time of the day. So you can see if there's any changes that need to be made, 
um, as you're keeping track of everything that you're putting in. Good tools though. Um, if you do want to schedule for the body composition analysis, uh, that's something you can call our um, learning center or go on our learning center website and they can give you all the information and the details about um, getting scheduled for that. So being active is also a very important part of living a healthy lifestyle. Your goal should be to aim for at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise each day. Now, sometimes things happen can't get the full 30 minutes in, but I think it's a pretty reasonable goal. Um, you should include all four types of exercise though in your um, daily regimen. So the four types are the endurance, that's what um, used to be called cardiovascular or aerobic exercises. Those are the ones that's gonna get your breathing and your heart rate a little elevated. Um, second one is strength, that's with that pushing or pulling. I'm going to work on your muscle tone. Um, also, um, doing some type of strength training on your lower body helps keeping you at a low risk for falls. Um, we do know the statistic shows one in three of people the age 65 and over, one in three will fall every year. That is a very scary statistic. So making sure you work on your lower body with your strength training. Um, and then your flexibility and balance, these also are very important to keep you at a low risk for falls, um, but also help you with an overall healthier lifestyle. So trying to incorporate all four types of these activities in your daily exercise regimen. Uh, if you wanna break it up, break that 30 minutes up into three 10 minute sessions, that's okay. As long as you're still getting at least 30 minutes per day. Um, keeping track of your activities is important so you can monitor your progress. Um, you can see where you started and maybe you're not doing any type of activity and maybe by a month from now, you're actually doing your 30 minutes. So that's a big improvement. That's a great goal to set for yourself. Trying to do some type of activity to get your body up and moving. That's really what we want. Um, so research has shown that three to four sessions per week lasting on average about 40 minutes per session involving moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity can help lower your blood pressure, cholesterol, and keep your weight at a healthy level. So the moderate to vigorous intensity means if you're walking, maybe doing some brisk walking, that means that you can talk, you can have a conversation while you're doing it, but you can't sing. Now, if you're not a good singer, that's okay. It's still a good way to test if you're doing the moderate to vigorous intensity of that exercise. So you should be able to talk out loud, but you should not be able to sing out loud. Um, so if you're walking and you're able to sing, maybe start working up and try to pick up the pace just a bit um, to that moderate to vigorous, and, and then your three to four sessions per week, strive for that goal. So doing something is better than doing nothing. Um, if you're doing absolutely no type of physical activity now, start out slow, set you some reasonable goals. Um, like I said, maybe if you're doing nothing now, start with 10 minutes and then slowly work your way up. So even 10 minutes at a time um, may offer some health benefits. Um, studies have shown that people who achieved even a moderate level of fitness are much less likely to die early than those with the low fitness level. Um, and there are even some newer studies out that shown if you're doing absolutely nothing, starting with two minutes a day can significantly reduce your risk of all cause mortality. So dying for any reason. So no excuse, starting with even two minutes a day if you're doing nothing is a great start. So get up and do something, some type of physical activity. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is alcohol. This is always a, an exciting topic to talk about in the office when we have our classes. Um, limit the alcohol use. Now, the studies have said, if you don't drink alcohol now, don't start. So maybe your neighbor says, well, my doctor said that if I drink a glass of red wine every day, it puts me at a lower risk for heart disease. Okay, 
well, your neighbor can also get some grapes and get the same health benefits. So if you don't drink, don't start. If you do drink, moderation is key. So one standard drink is equal to 14 grams or 0 0.6 ounces of pure liquor. So that would equate to a 12 ounce can of beer, eight ounces of malt liquor, four ounces of wine, or a one and a half ounce or shot of an 80 proof distilled spirit or liquor. Now the guidelines show, I don't make these up, these are the guidelines for men less than the age of 65. So under 65, you should have no more than two alcoholic drinks per day. For men over the age of 65, that drops to one drink per day. For women, it is a set, a number to one alcoholic drink per day. Now, no, you cannot save all of these up until Friday night when you go out with your friends. This is one per day, period. You don't drink anything today. Tomorrow starts a new day. You still get one drink per day. You can't save them up and use them for the dinner that you have scheduled on Friday um, or Saturday at the square. It's one per day. That's a question we get a lot, actually. Um, the other one that we'll talk about is a heart-healthy diet. So a heart-healthy diet is one of the best things that you can do to help fight cardiovascular disease. Um, the foods and amount of foods that you eat can affect other controllable risk factors like your cholesterol, your blood pressure, diabetes, and even overweight. Um, it's suggested to use a smaller plate or bowl to help reduce your portion size. Um, eating larger portions of low calorie, uh, nutrient rich foods like your vegetables in all varieties. So if you go to the produce section, you'll notice the different colors of the fruits and veggies. Those different colors provide our body with different nutrients that it needs. So trying to eat larger portions of those foods are very important as far as a heart healthy diet. So we want lots of fruits and veggies um, and whatever else you're eating, smaller portions is important as well um, as the way that it's prepared. So we know fried foods, um, those creamy sauces, those aren't necessarily a heart healthy diet. So being more aware of what you're eating is key. Um, limit the sodium as well. So a lot of processed foods and foods when you go out, um, they're high in sodium. So being more aware when you're grocery shopping, it does require to um, read the nutritional facts. You'll see on there the amount of sodium um, for whatever the product is that you're purchasing. And be aware, look for low sodium or no sodium foods. Uh, you can also, um, there's some salt alternatives for when you're cooking at home. I believe Mrs. Dash is the one that's a salt alternative. They have all different flavors for all different foods, but that's a great way to still get some type of flavor and seasoning in your foods, yet avoiding the sodium. Um, with a heart healthy diet, you wanna increase the amount of potassium and fiber um, that you're getting in and high in fruits, veggies, whole grains, lean protein, and low fat dairy all follow within that heart healthy diet. Um, you should be substituting uh, with uh, unsaturated fats. So saturated fats are not good. Unsaturated fats are a little better. So try to substitute those where possible. And then also limit your red meats sugary foods and processed foods because we know those all contain all different types of additives and preservatives that are not necessarily beneficial for our body. Um, I will also say that pork is considered a red meat. Um, it was a great advertisement talking about pork, the other white meat, but it is still considered a red meat. So trying to limit the amount um, of red meats that you eat is important. Um, trying to eat more fish and poultry is following a heart healthy diet to try to replace some of that red meat. Um, and then add more of the salt free herbs and spices that we discussed like that Mrs. Dash. Now you're human, you're still allowed to indulge yourself every once in a while, just not necessarily with every meal every day. Um, and if you do get off track, that's okay. 
just try to get right back on track to where you were the next day or the next meal. So you're human, you're allowed to do that, but just try to get back on track as soon as possible. So now we're gonna talk about stress. I'm sure everyone can agree that at some point or another in their life, they've had some added stressors that can impact your entire, your entire mood, your entire day. So stress is, again, needed, but high levels can impact your um, health physically and emotionally. So when we're stressed, most people tend to exercise less. Maybe you don't wanna to go to the gym. Maybe you don't wanna go for that walk. You don't wanna see any people. Um, we also tend to eat more and the foods that we're eating are not necessarily the best. We're not following that heart healthy diet that we had just discussed. We're making poor choices and eating um, those foods that we should be limiting. Um, when you're stressed, we also tend to have some sleep problems. Maybe you lay down in bed at night and your mind is just going a thousand miles a minute and you're not able to shut it down to be able to get a good night's rest. So that puts you at a higher risk for um, heart attack and stroke as well, being stressed. Some ways that have been shown to help relax your mind, maybe write your thoughts or your emotions down. Uh, you still have them there with you, but you don't have to necessarily put them as a priority in your mind. Some people also like to talk things out, laugh about it, cry about it, get, get mad about it, punch your pillow whatever's needed to help express your emotions and, and relax your mind even a little bit. I know here within the Villages Health, we have a wonderful behavioral health department um, that includes some licensed social workers. And if talking about it or expressing your emotions um, is something that you know you need, maybe that's something to talk to your doctor about and see if they can get you an appointment with them. Um, you can also do something you enjoy. Maybe you enjoy gardening. Maybe you enjoy going for a walk, taking the dog to, for a walk. Also focus on the present. Sometimes the, the past kind of lingers and holds us up from moving forward. And although it's very hard to focus on the present, um, it's important to help your mind relax and to try to at least temporarily shut off some of those things that are keeping our mind racing. Also take time for yourself. Sometimes we get so focused on doing things for everyone else and, and going, going, going. It's hard for us to take time and feel like we get to rest. What is it that you need? What is it that, that you need to help relax yourself, relax your body, your mind? Maybe it is just sitting on the back porch doing nothing, just listening to the birds, listening to the surroundings. Maybe it's going to get a massage. Maybe it's escaping in a book. Maybe you like to read. Maybe you wanna go watch a movie. You can go watch a movie by yourself if you want to. That's okay. Do something that you enjoy um, taking time for yourself, whatever that may be. Maybe you need to go on a road trip. Um, make sure your friends and family know that you're leaving so they don't think that you ran away. Um, let them know that, you know what? I just need to go and, and get away for a little bit. That's okay. You're allowed to do that. Sometimes we need that to just get a new start, take a deep breath and, and just live. We're human, we're allowed to do those things. Some other ways that some people um, like to relax your body is exercise. So if you enjoy exercising, doing some of those different types, like your aerobic exercises, go for a jog, do some strength training, maybe some yoga. Um, Doing some type of exercise can help release those different feelings that you're experiencing that's causing the stress that you have as well. Um, now, the note in here on the middle where it's bolded, being sedentary has the same damaging effects as smoking. So let me read that one more time. Being sedentary, doing nothing, no type of physical activity, has been proven to have the same damaging effects as smoking. So that's a real eye opener. So making sure you're incorporating some type of physical activity. If you are stressed and just sitting at home doing nothing, those damaging effects um, are gonna take a toll on your body and your mind. 
So if this is something the stress is adding up and you just don't want to do anything, talk to anybody, um, talk to your doctor because they have lots of different methods that they can help you with to manage through that stress. Um, we also talked about massage, maybe some aromatherapy, hot showers. There are a lot of different things that you can do to help uh, manage through some stress and relax your body. Some of these things work for some people and not others, and that's okay. If you try something and it doesn't help, try something else. Don't give up. Um, but again, if, if the stress is something that is getting harder and harder on you, talk to your doctor about it because if it builds up, then that puts you at a higher risk for ha having a heart attack or stroke. And that's what we want to avoid. So talking about the prevention, um, so for heart attack and stroke, so get to your healthy body weight. Um, if you are in the overweight, obesity, or in the other um, higher levels for your body weight, set a goal and strive to reach that goal because moving towards that direction, even if it's a slow and steady pace, you'll still get some health benefits to working towards your goal. Um, eating a heart healthy diet with uh, the unsaturated fats, lots of veggies, lean proteins, um, poultry, fish, uh, low sugar, high fiber, all of these things are part of that heart healthy diet. So trying to stick to it as much as possible um, is also something you can do to hopefully prevent a heart attack or stroke from occurring. Exercise, so at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity. And then adding your strength, balance, and flexibility in as well. Um, now, remember, if you're doing nothing now, start slow. Let your body adjust to these changes that you're making and slowly work your way up to the 150 um, per week. Um, the fourth one on here is stress. If you notice it, manage through it if you can. If you can't, talk to your doctor so they can assist you with that. Also, making sure that you're always staying hydrated. Um, Water is important. Now we're in the state of Florida, so summer is very rapidly approaching. Um, we have 90 degree weather and even hundreds um, that's coming quick. So staying hydrated is very important, as well as having your routine health screenings that your doctor provides um, and suggests for you. So again, we can see the outside of our body, but we don't have x-ray vision. We can't see what's happening on the inside. That's where these health screenings definitely come into play. So we can see if there is something that's starting to change, the doctor can work with you and hopefully manage through whatever that is and get it back to the healthy range that it should be in. And then the last bullet on here is take your medications as prescribed. So if your cholesterol was high and your doctor suggested a cholesterol lowering medication, take it. If they suggest taking your medications twice a day at certain times, that's for a reason. Um, maybe that's to help balance it out so it lasts a, over a 24 hour period. Um, the doctors do prescribe these for your own health. So making sure you take them as prescribed when they are prescribed is very important. And one of the parts in preventing um, heart attack and stroke. So if you do have any questions um, pertaining to this entire seminar, I do urge you to um, give us a call at the Learning Center with the Villages Health. The number is 352-308-1664. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the seminar, and uh, we look forward to sharing some more of these with you in the near future. Have a great day.